Sizzler has failed. However, this depends on the country you are in, as Sizzler in the United States is different from the one abroad. And in this video, we will look at the conflicting history of Sizzler and its ownership. The name Sizzler is confusing, as it means both a restaurant and a type of meal, at least depending on where you are from and where you are. If you are in an Indian community and you say Sizzler, you will surely evoke some deep feelings of nostalgia and an emotional tie to Mumbai, India. Also, you would rouse some appetites. The food, which is popular in the Indian community, is a complicated plate of French fries with a bright red sauce mixed in with rotini and penne pasta. Also mixed with the dish are grilled onions, paneer, and bell peppers, then topped with thinly sliced cabbage, shredded cheese, carrots, green chutney, and two large samosas. That is a lot of stuff on a plate. Oh, we should also add that the platter of food may come in the shape of a nandi, a Hindu sacred cow. While different, the food and the restaurant share a similar history with Del Johnson at its center. Apparently, in the 1960s, Faraz Irani, an Indian businessman, had a fateful encounter with the Sizzler Steakhouse in California. He fell in love with the meal preparation process, which consisted of smoke in the room and the sizzling sound the plate made when the steak was put on it. The businessman took the idea to India and opened up his first shop in Mumbai. He also changed some ingredients, using Indian versions of them while still maintaining some of the non-Indian elements. Faraz's version was a hybrid meal with Indian spices like garam masala or fenugreek, but this is just one version of the story. Indian food writers say that Faraz's version of the meal was not inspired by the platter he had in California. They say he modeled it around the Japanese teppanyaki dish owing to his Japanese wife. These food writers also say that Faraz's wife's influence showed how he served his food on a sizzling hot cast iron plate, which was popular in Western-style steakhouses in some parts of Asia. Faraz's restaurant closed, but his son Sharuk wasn't about to let it stay closed. He opened two of his own. The first one was Tushi in Mumbai, which he opened in 1967. The second one, The Place, Touche the Sizzler in Poon, came four years after. The two restaurants specialized in the meal, and soon, restaurants all over India adopted the meal into their menu. And if you like to learn about the history of your favorite eateries, be sure to subscribe for more content like this. Del Johnson was a California ice cream seller in the early 1950s, but everything was about to change. Del visited New York and wanted to eat. He entered a steakhouse and saw how they serve steak on a hot platter. Dell fell in love with the dish, and when he returned to his native Culver City, California, he decided to open his own steakhouse. In 1958, Dell and his wife Helen opened their restaurant, Sizzler Family Steakhouse, where steak platters became their signature meal. The couple at first looked committed to seeing their business succeed and expand. However, the two grew tired by 1966 and chose to sell to Jim Collins. It was Jim that led the restaurant's expansion into a chain that was mostly in the western part of the United States, but he didn't do so without making some changes. The major one was that the restaurant's famous sizzle had to go. The business continued to operate and tried to stay ahead of its competitors by offering promotions. In the late 1970s and early 80s, the company had steak and combination steak dinners with an optional salad bar ongoing. However, in trying to ensure that customers had quality meals, the business's food was slightly more expensive than others. So when two competitors, Ponderosa Steakhouse and Bonanza Steakhouse, emerged in the early to mid-80s, the steak chain had to get creative. And it did. It introduced promotions such as the all-you-can-eat fried shrimp. Then it turned its salad bar into a buffet, or the buffet court, as the business called it. But this backfired not so deliciously. The business grew as it opened its first location in Australia in 1985, but there was danger ahead, and it was something the company had itself created. Rather than use the buffet as an add-on to a meal, the customers began to have it as a meal. Sizzler reacted to this customer choice by saving costs on other menu items, which severely reduced the quality of those items. Then the company sought to push people away from the buffet. It offered customers free grilled cheese bread rolls before they ate from the buffet. The grilled bread made customers fill up and not eat from the buffet too much. This idea must have appeared sound when the company first thought of it, but when they applied it, it ruined their reputation as customers figured out their scam. However, this didn't stop the brand's popularity outside of America, as it could sell franchises. 
Royal Holdings Company Limited, a Fukuoka-based food service company, owned the Japanese franchise and opened the first store in 1991, and by 2021, it had 10 restaurants. As if this wasn't enough, the company's reputation was further hit in 1993, when an outbreak happened. In their Washington and Oregon stores, there was an E. coli outbreak that put customers in grave danger. Their meat supplier, Excel, allegedly sold them tainted meat, which the company's staff prepared near the items used in the salad bar. While the company survived the scandal, it lost its locations in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. Then, in 1996, the worst happened. But before that, the business had some good news. Minor Food Group, through its subsidiary SLRT Limited, owned the Thailand franchise and opened the first store in 1996. However, this growth did not translate to success for the chain in its home soil. In 1996, the chain declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy to escape costly leases on unprofitable restaurants. As a result, the business, which had over 270 stores at its peak, had to close around 130 of them. The company escaped bankruptcy in 1997, and it regained the focus it lost. The business changed management and improved food quality, but prices also went up. Then in 2000, the company experienced another E. coli outbreak, which hospitalized about 60 people, one dying. The events were similar to the one that happened in 1993, and so all the strategies to improve that the company embarked on didn't work out as the company hoped. Eventually, 21 locations closed in 2001. On the other hand, in Thailand by 2001, the number of stores grew to 19. But the company wasn't about to just roll over. It began to remodel, introduced a new restaurant type with a more open dining area. The menu improved with the focus returning to steaks, seafood, and the salad bar. The controversial all-you-can-eat buffet became the choice of the franchise owners. Some kept it and others let it go. In 2005, Pacific Equity Partners, an Australian-based investment firm, bought the chain, and drama soon followed. Multi-State Lottery Association of Urbandale, Iowa, decided to use the business name and added the prefix the. So instead of Sizzler, theirs was the Sizzler, Hot Lotto. The execs at Multi-State must have some humorous folks among them. In 2011, the United States branch of the business led by its CEO and backed by a U.S. management group decided they wanted to buy the American locations from Pacific Equity Partners after it had formally put the American branch for sale in 2008. With the sale, Pacific Equity Partners would own the areas outside the United States, which would be operated or licensed by Australia-based Collins Foods. The American branch of the company then moved the HQ from the founding city of Culver City, California, to Mission Viejo, California, in 2012. In 2020, Sizzler declared that it had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection due to how COVID-19 affected its business. It had to close dining rooms temporarily, so business wasn't coming in. The company couldn't pay rent and couldn't partially open because its California locations were in badly hit areas. The pandemic caused the chain to close more stores, bringing its 134 locations to 107 in 10 states. Things were better for the international branches, but not the ones in Australia. In 2006, it temporarily closed salad bars across units in Australia when it discovered rat poison in two restaurants. The poisoning attempts looked fishy, or you could say the restaurant smelled a rat and was certain someone was targeting it. Employees found the person, and it turned out to be a woman with a mental illness. But the Australian branch was ailing, and by 2013, revenue stagnated. The company blamed consumers' attitude, which continued to the point that Collins Foods saw the company as a capital drainer. Collins Foods wrote down the value of Sizzler by 37.0 million Australian dollars, and during the next investors' meeting, it decided to cut its losses in the business, and the steak chain began to close down. By late 2020, the chain was no more in Australia. The Thailand branch, however, has been doing well, even during the pandemic, as it creatively found a way to adapt, and it opened 54 out of the 60 restaurants it temporarily closed. The business began to use robotic servers to limit human contact to abide by the Thailand government's laws during the pandemic. The Thailand franchise didn't mope around due to its losses and immediately began to work on expansion plans. Sizzler has a turbulent history, and some of its problems were of its own making. There are a lot of things the business could have done differently. 
But maybe the most important thing they could have done differently was their initial sale. Should Dell and Helen have held on to the business longer, or would everything have been the same even if they did? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to support our channel.